Thank you all for being here. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Cantor Ilana Wolpert of B'nai Israel Congregation in Washington, D.C., Rockville, Maryland. But way more importantly, I'm here as one of Greta Budin's many nieces. And um, I'm just going to preside over this final formal farewell to the most wonderful person in the world. Um, and of course, we'll be able to um, reminisce later when we get together. Um, but for now, we begin the way our Jewish tradition uh, has always begun, uh, with the words in English, praised is the judge of truth. In Hebrew, Baruch Dayan Emet. Adonai Natan v'adonai lakach, yehi shem Adonai mevorach. Adonai has given and Adonai has taken. Praised be the name of Adonai. I am going to chant the words to Psalm 23 and then read them in English. And if you know them by heart, please join me in English. Mizmor le David, Adonai roi lo echsar. Binot deshe yarbitseni, al me menuchot yenahaleni, nafshi shove. Yan cheni ve maglet sedek le maan shemu. Gam ki elech begeit salmavet, lo irara ki ata imadi. Shiftecha umishantecha, hema yenacha muni. Ta aroch lefanai shulchan neget sorerai. Di shanta vashem en roshi, kosi revaya. Ach tov achesed yerefuni, kol yemei chayai. Veshavti bevet Adonai leorech The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Words of Ecclesiastes. A season is set for everything, a time for every experience under heaven, a time for planting and a time for reaping, a time for keeping and a time for discarding, a time for loving and a time for hating, a time for embracing and a time for refraining, a time for slaying and a time for healing, a time for laughing and a time for weeping, a time for dancing and a time for wailing, a time for birthing and a time for dying, a time for speaking and a time for silence, a time for seeking and a time for losing. It's really wonderful to, to I'm not going to give a eulogy, but it, it's wonderful to say a few words about a person when everyone in the room knows that person so well and, and knows how, what a treasure, I'll use your word, jo Joanne, what a treasure that person was, what a magical person. So I'm just going to say a few words about Aunt Greta. Um, I, mostly what I feel standing up here today is gratitude. So grateful to have had her in my life. My childhood would have been a completely different childhood without her. I remember, well, I don't really remember the beautiful, elaborate birthday cake she made for my first birthday, but I do, I do remember seeing the big, glossy, black and white photos with me and my fist crushed into the frosting. <laughs> I remember the warmth of holidays spent at Uncle Joe and Aunt Greta's house, the singing, the amazing food. 
I remember the wedding shower she and another cousin provided for me when I married Lawrence. More than anything, I remember the laughter. I remember going up to her house on Belmar. We lived on the other side of Belmar. So I had to cross Avalon, to get, Avondale, to get up to her house. And I remember going up there and finding her on the living floor, surrounded by cardboard boxes full of laughter. Clippings from the newspaper, funny headlines, and just laughing for hours. What a gift memory is. And unfortunately, in the last few years of Greta's life, she didn't have very good memory. But I hope fervently, somewhere deep inside, wherever memories live when they disappear from the conscious, I hope she remembers how deeply I loved and admired her. I'm going to call up my cousins now, Greta's sons, Howard, David, and Noah Budin. the uh, last time you'll see me in a suit, probably, <laughs> for a while. Somebody else might die. Never can tell. Well, <laughs> if that happens, I have the suit. I'm, I'm Noah. I'm the youngest of Greta's three sons, <coughs> and this is my uh, much older brother, David, <laughs> and my very much older brother, Howard. And um, first, so actually, if you want to, first I'm going to sing a song. So, maybe, so hmm? the song doesn't come till here. Well, I, he's going to sing a song anyway. I know, but Howard doesn't speak until you know page 37. So, <laughs> I just don't want to hit you with the guitar. Uh, our mother uh, instilled. You can sit here. Well, you picked up the guitar. So. Okay. <laughs> We didn't choreograph this before. Okay. Here we Let's go. Ahead. Our mother instilled in all of us uh, a, a love of music. Uh, she was my first music teacher. I remember at a very, very early age. Um, you know, I didn't go to preschool. There really wasn't preschool in those days. And so she spent every day with me and singing with me. And she taught me. I could sing rounds at, at a, like three, four years old, and harmonies she taught me how to sing. And then had a little, then she, in fact, made me go to uh, music lessons. And um, that's a whole other story about how she made me, <laughs> she used to bribe me with food to go to music <laughs> lessons um, down at the music settlement. Um, and so uh, we will be singing a few songs uh, today. Uh, and I, I'll ask you to hold applause just to keep it more of a memorial setting than rather than a concert. So why don't you say something about it? Uh, Greta Mervis, as she was then, went to Roosevelt Junior High, which was over there, in case you need to get there. Um, and that's, that's where she met Joe Budin. Good luck finding it. Huh? I know, it's gone. Um, she met Joe Budin, who was two years ahead of her in school, uh, but they really got to know each other at Euclid Avenue Temple because they were both members of the junior choir there. And my father wrote uh, a music for a you know, song that the choir could sing, but there were no words, so the director asked for volunteers, for uh, somebody to write the words, and my mother told me that she thought that Joe was cute, so she volunteered. And she, they worked on the song, and that's, that's where they got to know each other. And I think really neither of them ever went with anyone else. Oh, this is the song. So, right, and so it's fitting. You know, all three of us are musical. We all play instruments, and uh, the two of us became songwriters and uh, play music professionally. Um, and so th that, that family legend or, uh, you know, is fitting, a fitting way for them to have met and for us to be here today. So we'll, we'll uh, add music to this memorial. 
here's a song I wrote uh, during the last weeks of my mother's life. Um, and that's all I'll say about it, except that. on the bed as I stroke her head and sing my song and each breath is holy we are losing her slowly shake those chains away spread love before today is gone Gravity is cruel, rise up like a wave, then fall out of the sky toward earth like a slave to the memories we've lost, standing on the shore, hoping there is more beyond that line, and each breath is are losing her slowly. I've heard the children sing, even broken wings can fly. in the room searching for the door maybe in and out are the same and there's more to know than the dark seeping through the cracks light will take us back and love will win even endings are holy the ending never comes slowly. We'll meet face to face in the place where we begin. Any given day, any given hour, every given moment's filled with the power of love. Tomato Princess of Pittsburgh dies at 95 and a half years old is not a headline you will see in the Pittsburgh Post Gazette or the Cleveland Plain Dealer or anywhere, but that is how my mother often referred to herself, the Tomato Princess of Pittsburgh. Um, and it's more often how we referred to her and her grandchildren called her the Tomato Princess. Rachel even made her a Tomato Princess birthday cake one year. Greta Budin was born in Pittsburgh in 1923 to Charles and Fanny Mervis. Charles was in the produce business, became very, very wealthy from it, and he was dubbed by Pittsburghers the Tomato King of Pittsburgh. 
And so it stood to reason in my mother's mind as a little girl that if her father was the tomato king, she absolutely was the tomato princess. And that's what she was. It was her self-appointed title from then on. And she also, 95 and a half, she also used that half-year marker her whole life. You know, you do it when kids are one and a half and two and a half. And then at a certain age, maybe, well, I'm, you know, I'm 95 and a half. She did it for her whole life. How old are you? I'm 47 and a half. I'm 53 and a half. I'm 62 and a half. She used that her whole life. She led a long and rich life, many adventures, many interests. Um, she'll best be remembered for uh, four things. Uh, her love and talent for cooking and baking. We were talking about that earlier. Her um, artistic creativity. Uh, her sweetness, kindness, and generosity of, of spirit. And her quick, sharp, and often irreverent sense of humor. <laughs> the sense of humor. The more people have mentioned that to me over this last week than just about anything else about my mother. And that's fine with me. It's a, in fact, uh, when people say you come from a funny family, I, that's a very high praise. That's a high compliment indeed. Uh, Rabbi, if I mispronounce it, I have some rabbis who will help me. Uh, Rabbi Yochanan ben Baroka. You don't, even, you don't even know who that is, do you? Um, sec, second century sage in Talmud said, uh, a clown may be first in the kingdom of heaven if he or she has helped lessen the sadness of human life. So funny family is, is OK with me. Here's uh, a little more of, of Greta's history. We're not going to do a whole biography. Um, but we'll give you some of the highlights, especially especially the funny ones. Oh. Greta was born in Pittsburgh in 1923. Her sister, B was six years older. Their mother, Fanny, died when Greta was less than one year old. And her father, Charles, got remarried within a couple of years to Ricky. So I'm just going to tell some of the uh, more interesting parts of her life. Um, when she was three, she was kidnapped. They lived in a, the, they were very wealthy, because my grandfather, my great grandfather. How well, wealthy were they? Wait. They were so wealthy <laughs> that um, he, he, he was that, yeah, that somebody wanted to kidnap her for ransom. Uh, in fact, uh, they lived in a 29 room house. And one time, Could my that, mother that and I. called a mansion, wouldn't it? It might be, like yes, in my opinion. Um, and uh, one time my mother and I got a tour of the Ohio governor's mansion by Janet Voinovich, the governor's wife, and she started out by saying, this is a 26-room house. And my mother said, I grew up in a 29-room house. <laughs> and Janet Voinovich said, so the first... <laughs> <coughs> and... Um, so she was kidnapped, and uh, it was really, she was kidnapped by the, the maid and the butler, who had just been fired. Always the butler. Yeah, it's always the, <laughs> the butler did it. Um, and uh, it was, I mean, it was a fairly uneventful kidnapping, because, I mean, she, she knew them, and uh, she kind of had a good time at their house. And, and they figured out who did it, and they went and, you know, and they said, oh, okay, here, here she is. That was about it. Uh, I mean, the people might have gone to jail. I, I don't know. Uh, I could look that up, I guess. Um, her father was very protective of her, and maybe overprotective. And he sent her to kindergarten the first day with her own rug, an oriental rug because he didn't want her to sit on the floor because she would get a cold, of course. So when she got there, the teacher said, well, this wouldn't be fair to the other kids, so she wouldn't let her sit on the rug. And my mother got a cold, and my <laughs> father pulled her out of school, and she, she never went to kindergarten again. Um, so she was raised by her stepmother, 
who, um, did, you know, she really, they, they loved each other, they had a great relationship, and to the point where uh, when we were little, and she would read, my mother would read uh, stories that had the wicked stepmother in it, she would never say that. She would always call her the wicked queen or the wicked witch or something. So she refused to say wicked stepmother. <coughs> Um, well, let's move on. Okay. So when Greta was nine, Ricky became pregnant with Greta's brother, Chuck. But their father died okay. shortly before Chuck was born. Ricky moved back to her hometown, Cleveland, with Chuck and Greta. <clears throat> Dee stayed in Pittsburgh to finish high school and later moved to Cleveland. This was during the height of the Depression, and Charles had already lost his money. Ricky went to work to support the family first with relatives, cousins Malcolm and Kate. <clears throat> when they moved to Cleveland, first they moved in with relatives. In Pittsburgh, where Greta had lived a sheltered life, she didn't often play with other kids, but now she had cousins, Malcolm and, Malcolm and Kate, living in the same house. So she liked that. And uh, they, they had a lot of fun. And uh, I'm just going to tell one, one thing about that time. The story that really sticks with me is uh, it was the height of the depression and they would spend the week uh, gathering trying to gather 10 cents to, and then on Saturday one of them would be elected to go to a movie for, with, the, with the 10 cents and then come home and spend the whole rest of the day telling the movie <laughs> to the other two which actually would be a very good exercise for, for writing anybody wants to be a writer, go do that. Go see a movie every week and come home and tell everybody every detail about it. Oh. And after a while, Ricky and Greta and Chuck uh, moved to Cleveland, where Ricky was from. Ricky was the stepmother, by the way. Did we say that? Yeah. Oh. And they lived in an apartment above Uberstein's Drugstore, which is now Hunan on Coventry. Um, they lived on the second floor, the top floor. And as I said, this was the Depression. There was a big fire, I think, that started in the drugstore and moved all the way up. And they, had, they still had a few possessions from when they were a wealthy family. One was a Steinway piano which burned up and crashed through the floor. The other was uh, Charles's uh, Stradivarius violin, which burned up. And they had their money in a money box, because nobody went to banks anymore during that time. But they forgot it, left it in. This was in the middle of winter, places on fire. My mother ran back in to the burning building to save the money box. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was that. It was around that time that Greta and Joe met. Um, Dad uh, at that time was uh, delivering, he drove a delivery truck delivering fish. And <laughs> Ricky was, was a single working mother. I mean, this was unusual for a woman at that time. And uh, she would leave the house and she would, you know, Greta would go to school and Joe would go to school and they'd come home after school before Ricky was home and, and Ricky would say to her, and I, I don't want Joe Budin coming over after school. And my mother would say, okay. And then Ricky would, of course he would, Joe Budin would <laughs> come over and, you know, park the fish truck and go up and spend some time and leave. And then Ricky would come home and go, <laughs> Joe Budin was here. <laughs> she, could, she could tell. So two years after Joe graduated from High Tai, and right after Greta graduated, America entered World War II. And uh, Joe enlisted in the Navy because he hated walking and didn't want to get drafted into the Army. And uh, he was stationed in San Francisco, where he was assigned to a troop transport ship that went back and forth to the Philippines. And um, that's the end of, that's the, end of to that the, part? To the Philippines. Oh. Um, so at age 19, uh, Greta took the train 
to California, uh, where she and Joe got married in 1943. Uh, after the war, Howard was born in 1946. Uh, 1948, Joe's brother David died. And uh, when Joe came home to Cleveland for the funeral, his family convinced him to move his, his family back to Cleveland. My mother loved San Francisco, but <coughs> they came back. Uh, six months after they moved back, David was born. That's why his name is David. Um, not because they moved back, but because the, the brother <laughs> had passed away. Then Greta went to work uh, in 1956 at the Coventry Library, which was the main library then, before the Lee Road Library was built. And um, the, the two stories I remember most about that was uh, she worked for the head librarian, Miss Lynch, and she often would answer the phone by saying, um, or she would tell people, I'm sorry, Miss Lunch is out to Lynch. <laughs> and, uh, which was unusual, because Cleveland Heights was still very liberal back then. <laughs> um, and the other one was uh, you know, Dr. Spock lived in Cleveland Heights for a while, for several years, on Fairmount. And uh, he had written what the book that was for 50 years was the best selling, the second best selling book in the world, uh, Baby and Child Care. You know what the first, the top selling book is? Right. Uh, we don't know who wrote that. <laughs> well, some, some of them might yeah, think, somebody think they know. I think you know. Um, so Greta worked until Noah was born in uh, May of 1960 on Mother's Day, which was coincidentally nine months after Howard's bar mitzvah and its subsequent family vacation to Canada, where for the first time we had a room separate from our parents. <laughs> it was a nice hotel. <laughs> it was. Yeah, the Elmwood Casino in Windsor, Ontario. No. For much of my childhood, mom didn't drive. She didn't learn to drive until she was 40. Uh, for her 40th birthday, uh, my father got her driving lessons and a Corvair. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know how when uh, sometimes you get, you know, I guess sometimes, you, you get older and uh, your children then want to take the keys away from you. Um, my mother should have had the keys taken away from her at the age of 40 years and one day. Um, she, she'd never wanted to drive. She was not a good one. Uh, in fact, on that day, I remember, that was really little, but I remember that my father opened the door and said, happy birthday, and she sees a car, and she ran back into the house and threw up. Um, <laughs> This is true. And then uh, the driving instructor came. The day came for the first lesson. This is, this is all true. Uh, and uh, this was maybe not the best omen, actually. He, Mr. Farragher from Town and Country came up. We had five or six steps leading up to the front door. He knocked on the door. We came to the door. My mother's getting ready for the first lesson. He turned around and fell down the steps. That's, that's the way my mother's driving career started off. Um, my father and I used to, uh, we had a little routine about this. We had a little running gag, which always made her angry and laugh at the same time. I would, at any given moment, I would come into the house and say, Dad, Mom ran over my bicycle again. And he'd say, well, I told you not to leave it on the porch. <laughs> That's all I got about driving. That's all I got about driving. So after living upstairs in the first house at the top of Belmar since 1948, can't hear that, okay. Joe and Greta and the kids in 1964 moved to the downstairs of the second house, the house next door. Mom used to always say we were moving slowly out of the neighborhood. <laughs> that's, just, that's really as far as we got until a much bigger move. <clears throat> Greta went back to work in 1972 in the corporate offices of Gray Drug. Downtown at 666 Euclid. At, right, no, that number is no longer there. <laughs> the building is. They changed the number. A um, <laughs> couple of stories about that. Uh, 
my, my mom was funny. We, we've been talking about this, her sense of humor, uh, but both intentionally and sometimes unintentionally and irreverent also, sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally. But, um, and so uh, we're, I'm not really going to shy away from telling you any of these stories, but uh, no. Uh, <laughs> um, so at Grey Drug, for instance, here's two Grey Drug stories. One time, the supervisor of her department, she worked in the accounting department, uh, called a meeting and said, we're doing a little restructuring. Uh, would anybody like to be in a different position? And my mother said, I'd like to be lying down. <laughs> and he said, what? She said, no, 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 nothing, go on. And then, uh, for most of my life, my father was not well. He had heart disease and diabetes and was in and out of the hospital. Um, and uh, so one day, they, all the people in the department knew that he was in the hospital, and um, <laughs> somebody asked my mother, uh, Greta, how's, how's, what, how's Joe today? And she, well, what she, uh, what she meant to say was, today he's having his left ventricle tested. <laughs> That's not, that's not what, I'll leave it to you. I mean, what, you know, it was one of those moments, one of those moments where everybody was typing and they all went. <laughs> she said, oh, what I meant was. So, so in the mid 80s, she uh, went to work for Agnes Smith, who's right there, uh, managing the office of Agnes's psychology practice. And she worked well into her 80s and only stopped because Agnes retired. She would have kept, kept working. Um, but one thing about that was she said that uh, clients would come in and be waiting for their appointment to, to talk to Agnes. And um, they would start telling my mother their problems. And uh, my mother would tell them stuff. And then uh, she would say, well, you know, have you thought about this? And have, why don't you try this? And you can do that. And then the client would go in and talk to Agnes. And on the way out, they'd say, Agnes said you were right. <laughs> so. Well, in, in 1989, Joe died. Uh, six of Greta and Joe's grandchildren had been born by that time. All of them after Greta and Joe were 60 years old. <clears throat> and all three of Greta's great-grandchildren were born after she was 90 years old. One of them is here. I don't know what happened to him. When uh, her first great-grandchild, uh, Weston, was born, we took Greta to see the new baby the first day. And on the way into the room, Greta suddenly announced, I want her to call me Gigi for great-grandmother. So that's what uh, Weston and then Baxter have called her. And um, all three great-grandchildren, including Noah's daughter, Rachel's baby, who's here somewhere, right? I don't hear him, but um, have uh, visited with Gigi every week of their lives, up to one week before Greta died. This is you. This is me. Oh, well, I'm supposed to tell you to tell some stories about mom's creativity because a lot of that happened before I was born. As, did I mention I'm younger? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I was going to point out that among us three brothers, I knew mom the longest. <laughs> but no, no fair. <laughs> but, no, this, but the reason I say that is because that doesn't, mean that I have the most memories of her. <laughs> in fact, the opposite is probably true, partly because I'm, I moved to New York when I was 18 and never moved back again, so I wasn't living around here. I don't even know most of these anecdotes. And besides, my memory is probably the worst of anybody's. But as I was, th so I, I actually need some help from some people, possibly if they have examples of some of these things. As I was thinking about her life over the last week, one thing that really struck me was remembering how creative she was. <clears throat> she wasn't, people, a couple of people have mentioned this. She didn't have any training formally or anything like that, but she always wanted to be creative and lots of parts of her life were infused with different 
kinds of creative acts. And I've thought of four kinds, and I want to just briefly mention them. And the first two have to do with food. And the first one, I don't know if anybody can guess, is jello. <clears throat> so I'm not, I realize not everybody in this place will know all these things, but she was a jello artist. In fact, I don't know, Miriam, do you want to tell? Did you want to tell this? Yeah, we have to you know, talk. Do you want to say this? You can just turn around and say it. We could probably get more examples, but the second uh, kind of creativity involved making cakes. Does anybody remember her cakes? No. Not just ordinary cakes. I mean, what, the one I rem remember, does anybody want to tell a cake? We'll just do one. <laughs> when I remember she made cakes like ballparks, in the shape of ballparks with all the designs on them. I remember the guitar cakes. Oh, the guitar cakes. Yeah, I don't remember these right. things. Didn't she make the Globe Theater for your yeah, oh, the Globe right, Theater. The Globe okay. Theater for my college graduation. I mean, these weren't just and like a dragon. Oh yeah, the yeah. dragon, yeah, the, the serpent see. cake. Yeah, oh. see, see, I don't remember all these we things. Could, there's another <laughs> service here at three. We gotta. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just gonna mention real quickly. Okay, at three o'clock, really? I didn't yeah, know yeah. Oh, I don't know what it. time. What time is it? Somebody. Well, okay, we got. Okay, anymore. just mention these last two. The third one, nobody will remember but me. And if anybody works uh, knows people in the Cleveland Heights school system, I would appreciate it if they didn't tell them this part. Uh, they would probably take my diploma away. She did almost all of my projects <laughs> <laughs> in Roosevelt Junior High School. Just two of them I'll mention. One, I had an assignment to do a Roosevelt family tree and she took a huge piece of poster board and it, there were at least 200 ent family named entries on the tree and it said Roosevelt in ornate letters with gold leaf down the side and Luckily, nobody in the school system noticed that she'd misspelled Roosevelt, but that was okay. <laughs> and the other one was I, she did a, a paper mache model of the moon for me. It was wonderful balloon, you know, paper mache. Do you remember? I had that for years. I yeah, it was around the house for years. It was beautiful, the completely correct. Okay. And the fourth one, the fourth area was her candles. Does anybody else remember her candles? She made candles for people. She told me first it was for a business to make money. And it's true, she probably did get a few dollars from somebody or other ones from them, but she never could really do anything <laughs> for money. All of these things were really to help people or to express love or something like that. But there were, there was, uh, I won't even mention, there was a grand piano candle shaped exactly like a grand piano. You can get the idea. And I re remember coming down numerous times in the morning to the kitchen and there would be huge vats of paraffin still boiling on the stove. And the one time I remember best is walking into the kitchen in the morning and on the ceiling was a huge round spot big of gold spray, paint, spray, spray paint. paint. And David tells me that's because this is the, where her lack of formal training came in. She, <laughs> she had tried to open the can of spray paint with a can opener. 
<laughs> so, had a can opener, can opener that was mounted on the wall. One of those. Just open the spray paint. Yeah. Anyway, all those kinds of things. So, just some examples of her creativity, and we better move on. Yeah, we're going to move on. Let's just let's talk about her sense of humor a little bit more. We'll we'll give you a couple of uh, a few examples of some of the things she would say to us. Even when we were really little, she would say things like. What's pink and crawls on the ceiling? We'd say what? She'd say a banana. Right, you know, exactly. I was, don't get it. That I was never, I don't. I still don't get it. That I was like the it. first joke we all learned. <laughs> Just in in fact, I I told Weston that joke a couple days ago, and I said, "What's pink and crawls on the ceiling?" She said, "I don't know." I said, "A banana." She said, "Bananas aren't pink." <laughs> I said, "Oh, but they do crawl on the ceiling." <laughs> So um, I'll just give a couple of other examples. Um, Cantor Wolpert's sisters, is one of them here? Ricky's. She is? Oh. Um, are twins, and they're nine years younger than I am. And one time I remember, and they lived on our street, as Alana said. One time I remember walking with my mother, and she was pushing the double stroller with the twins and a strange woman came up to us and said, oh, are they twins? And my mother said, well, one of them is. <laughs> and the, the woman said, oh. I, I, don't, I don't know what she was actually thinking, but she <laughs> pretended to accept that answer. Um, and when I was in the Heights Choir, she was telling another choir mother that she had been in the Heights Choir herself, and the woman said, oh, I didn't know you could sing, and she said, oh, I, I could sing like Florence Nightingale. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, again, the woman said, hmm. Um, <laughs> she often, uh, she, she got her sense of humor from her mother, Ricky, her stepmother, Ricky, uh, and would repeat lines to me like, I'm sure most people know this old classic, but I, I grew up with this when I was really little. She would say, remember, eat every carrot and pea on your plate. <laughs> and we talked about her irreverent sense of humor when I was really little, and I didn't get this joke for a long time, but um, I do now. And she said, Noah, what's the difference between toilet paper and a towel? And I'd say, I don't know. And she'd say, so you're the one. I, I'll skip that one. I'll skip that one. I'll skip that one. Oh, really? So, uh, speaking of her irreverent sense of humor, there's always a few examples that I, that I think of. Uh, they went to, remember that store Chandler and Rudd on Van Aken, fancy food store, like the only one, the only fancy food store. In, in the 70s at that time. And um, they were walking around, they just couldn't believe how expensive everything was. You know, like a jar of jelly probably cost in the regular store 39 cents, and it was 7.50 there. They just couldn't believe it. And they ran into an old friend they hadn't seen for a long time. And they said, Sydney, how's, how's Sylvia? And she said, well, you know, she had a heart attack. And my mother said, must have been looking at these prices. <laughs> my father said, I'm, I'm not sure that's <laughs> appropriate. <laughs> and um, we had a neighbor across the street, neighbors who were there for a long time, and they suddenly disappeared. And years later, I ran into uh, a relative of theirs. And I, next time I was at my mother's, I said, I found out what happened to Mr. I'll change his name, to Mr. Schwartz. He was driving his truck. He, he, was a delivery guy, driving his truck and hit a big dip in the road, went down, smashed the top of his head on the truck, and now he's just a vegetable. And she said, hmm, squash? <laughs> um, and even uh, when she first moved into, uh, where did she move into? Menorah Park. Um, she met the uh, a, a social worker for the first time, asking her some questions, and my mother's nails were turquoise. And she said, oh, I, lo I love the color of your nails. And the woman said, you know, my, my grandmother, who's 95, 
just had her nails done, and every one's a different color. My mother said, yeah, probably wanted to get them all in while she's still alive. <laughs> you know, the woman gave me a look. I said, don't, don't look at me. You know. <laughs> and um, even like a few months ago, she wasn't talking much anymore. And we'd go, we'd take the kids. And I was sitting there with her silently for an hour, you know. And we're watching the kids. And just to try to make conversation, I said, boy, it sure is a lot easier being a grandparent than a parent. And she said, tell me about it. <laughs> like, where did that come from? Um, so my mother and I had a, I'm 58, we had about a 52 year running theme throughout our lives, um, which was carried out to literally the day she died. Um, <laughs> when I was little, when I was six or seven years old, my mother would put me in the bathtub uh, and watch me, of course, but leave the bathroom door open, and she would stand outside the bathroom door, and she would do magic. She would make the bathroom lights go off. Whether I could see her hands, she could apparently make it go off and on at will, and I would ask her, how did you do that? And she said, I will never tell you. I will never, and then as I got older, I would ask her again, I will never tell you, Mom, I've graduated from high school, now you can tell me about the lights, I'm never going to tell you. I'll never tell. Mom, I'm, I've, I'm a college graduate now. Maybe you can tell me about the... I'll never, I'll never tell. So, okay, Ma, now I'm married. I have kids. Maybe I want to do the trick. I'll never tell. <laughs> Several months ago, in the nursing home, as David said, we were vis I was visiting with, visiting with my daughters, Mariah and Rachel, and uh, trying to coax conversation, you know. And um, I, I gave it a shot. I said, she was expressionless for most of it, and you know, sat, sitting, staring. I said, Mom, how'd you make the lights go off? And she said, <laughs> I'll never tell. And I said, really, you're going to take? And I, the last day of her life, I was sitting with her, and she was not responsive, but I gave it one more shot. How'd you make the lights go off? Well, you never know, right? You know, they, hearing is the last to go, right? You never know what people, you've heard stories of people coming, uh, you know, and saying something. She didn't say anything. She passed away that morning. It was a Sunday. It was a Saturday night, Sunday morning, around 3 in the morning. Got the call, 3.30. Uh, Rachel and her family came over. Uh, Zach is there, Mariah is there, we're there, and we're sitting around the dining room table having lunch all together, and the lights go out. <laughs> it was a windy day, but the lights go out. And I looked up, and I wasn't even really thinking about this, and I said, Mom? <laughs> and Mariah said, Grandma made the lights go out. And we all laughed and cried in that moment. Clown may be first in the kingdom of heaven if she has helped lessen the sadness of human life. I have a feeling that if there is a heaven, Mom got right up to the front of that line. Our jobs as human beings is to bring as much light into this world as we possibly can. We bring it through acts of love and kindness, through our individual gifts, such as our humor, our, our baking, our music. When one bright light goes out, we need to amplify ours. Mom made the lights go out, but she brought much, much more light into this world. So one more time before this final light goes out here today, we'll sing, uh, I don't know if we have time for two songs at this point. Is anybody from Berkowitz here? We got time? We'll sing two more songs. The first is the second last song that I wrote a couple of months ago thinking about 
mom and our mortality. And then the last song is a song that, that we'll sing is a song I wrote in 2006. And again, we, we know applause. one actually I guess I could make it shorter by not using this when May seems the same as December take me home Take me home And the sun is just a small dying ember Take me home Take me home When you are but a stranger among all my friends And my friends are no longer by my side When the darkness is all I remember Take me home Take me home When your name slips like sand through my fingers Take me home Take me home And the shape of your face no longer lingers Take me home Take me home When my hands no longer know the way to make the music play and my heart forgets the melody inside And my song can no longer find the singer Take me home Home, take me My legs can no longer stand for freedom. Take me home, take me home. And my feet won't march for love or for reason. Take me home, take me home. If I sail upon the water in a boat I built with dreams and the hope upon the shore has all but died. My eyes no longer seek the harbor's beacon. Take me home, home, take me home. this song at almost every family event, mostly weddings. May the one who blessed our parents and their mothers and fathers before with love and with life to be husband and wife make a blessing on us once more 
May their light ever shine like the stars in the night. Like the sun, may she rise every dawn. May we dance in their circle. Let the music play on. May the one who blesses our union in your image, creator of life, bless our bodies within. May the touch of our skin be like angels with wings made of light. May we always know voices of children. May our voices remember their song. May we dance in their circle. Let the music play on and on. May the one who blesses our children Give them strength, give them wisdom to see That our lives never end And the future depends on their visions Of worlds yet to be May they fly on the wings of eagles May their journeys be joyful and long May we dance in their circle, let the music play on and on. May we dance in their circle, music play on. After the funeral, we will all meet at the home of Steve and St Sarah Stone, who have graciously offered us their home, 2350 Ardley Road in Cleveland Heights. Um, and we can be there till 8 o'clock. Now, may I ask you all please to rise for the El Male Rahamim. El male rachamim shochin mamromim Hametze menucha nechona tachat kanfe ashkina Bemaalot kedushim uteorim Kizor arakia mazhirim Et nishmat gitul ben chaim Shealcha li olama Began Eden, Tehei Menuchata, Ana Baal Rachamim, Hastirei Abeset Knafecha Leolamim, Hutzror Bitzror Achaim Et Nishmata, Adonai Hunachalata. Vitanuak Bishalom al Mishkava Venomar Amen. Greta Budin. May your music play on and on. Thank you. 